We like to believe that our justice system is free of errors, that it is impartial, that it will convict the guilty and free the innocent, that it will presume one's innocence until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. With that said, how is it that 1% of all convictions are wrongful? Numerous factors have repeatedly been found to contribute to the wrongful conviction of the innocent, such as public pressure to convict, unpopular defendant, tunnel vision, police misconduct, jailhouse informants, judicial bias, faulty forensic evidence, and eyewitness testimony. Until these factors are eliminated, wrongful convictions will continue to exist and likely become a larger problem. Do you know anything about wrongful convictions in Canada? Uh, no. Um, no. No? No. Uh, not too much. I should know more. Yeah. Uh, does that happen in Canada? When asked, most people are under the impression that wrongful convictions do not occur in Canada. In truth, however, wrongful convictions in Canada occur more frequently than expected. Several cases have been making headlines as this reality comes to light. Such cases include Donald Marshall, David Milgard, Thomas Sofno, Stephen Trescott, James Driscoll, and William Mullins Johnson. It is likely that numerous other individuals are in prison waiting for someone to realize and prove their innocence. Through the examination of past cases of wrongful conviction, we can only hope to uncover the errors that led to such injustices as to avoid them in the future. Do you know who Guy Paul Morin is? No. 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 We now invite you to accompany us as we unravel and dissect the very factors that led to the wrongful conviction of Guy Paul Morin. The missing persons poster still hangs on the front window of the Queensville General Store, even though Christine Jessup is no longer missing. Her body was found in the bush 40 kilometers away by a man walking with his children. Police are treating it as a murder. They say she'd been dead for a long time. The Jessup family, right from the outset, believed that uh, Christine had been taken from home, which caused the focus of the early investigation to be on people who lived nearby neighbors like the family of Al and Ida Moran uh, and in particular their, old, their son Guy Paul. The criminal proceedings against Guy Paul Moran represent a tragedy not only for Mr. Moran and his family but also for the community at large. The system failed him, a system for which we, the community, must bear responsibility. An innocent man was arrested, stigmatized, imprisoned, and convicted. The real killer has never been found. The trail grows colder with each passing year. For Christine Jessup's family, there is no closure. The reasons for the failure are set out in the video to follow. I said, well, you're under arrest for the murder of Christine Jessup, your neighbor. I said, right, come on, guys, you're kidding. He said, no, Guy, we're not. We know what we're doing. We don't make mistakes. The murder of Christine Jessup shocked the small community of Queensville. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, public fear skyrocketed as Jessup's killer remained at large. Fueling their anxiety was the realization that the killer was most likely a member of the community. Increased police presence, along with constant news coverage, also worked to create paranoia among the public. Gradually, the public began to believe and voice the opinion that the police were conducting their investigation irresponsibly. And with added surveillance of the media, police felt the pressure to convict a suspect more than ever. After the recovery of Jessup's body, police failed to secure the crime site by erecting a tent overhead so as to protect it from the impeding snowfall. 
Instead, a hurried search was carried on throughout the night, which resulted in recovering Jessup's recorder and a few buttons. Moreover, after interviewing several residing neighbours around the crime scene, it became evident that several people had heard a child screaming for help on the night of the murder. After conducting a poorly thought out experiment, the police reached the unlikely conclusion that it was impossible to hear a child scream from that distance. Police also engaged in tunnel vision when they neglected to investigate four other possible suspects, three of whom were known to be sexually aggressive. Furthermore, Detectives Fitzpatrick and Shepard convinced Janet Jessup to change the timing of her arrival at her house, allowing Marin time to be logically placed in the house with Christine. This testimony was crucial to the prosecution's defense. Overall, the police suppressed evidence including original crime scene notes and photos from the body site and also neglected to keep track of several other vital pieces of evidence. They were a very strange family. Christine's adopted and brother, Kenny. They were up all night, working in the yard. What did you think of, of Guy Paul Moran before all this happened? He just, he just seemed odd. Odd, a small town view of people who were working outdoors under living room lamps the night everybody else searched for little Christine Jessup. Odd. A family whose affection for each other made the neighbors nervous. Odd, Guy Paul Moran's idea of a good time was looking after beehives. You ready? Yep, I'm, I'm ready. ready. I'm ready. I'm lifting. Got it? No. And one of the investigating police officers would famously observe in his notes that Guy Paul was a weird type guy. evidence misinterpreted, but it was deliberately manipulated. Guy Paul was shown a photo of his own fingerprint while being interrogated by police, who told him that they had found it on Christine Jessup's clothes. In truth, it was actually retrieved from his clarinet. Moreover, many pieces of forensic evidence were brought into question and found to be faulty and inconclusive. In particular, hair fiber analysis was used to connect Guy Paul to the murder of Christine Jessup. Posing as a student hairdresser, an undercover cop collected a hair sample from Marin. After laboratory testing, Marin's hair was found to be similar to the black hair entwined in Christine Jessup's necklace. Although such analysis is often imperfect, this evidence was strong enough to convince the police that Marin was a culprit. An investigation of Marin's car also provided police with fiber material that was sent to the same lab as the hair samples retrieved from the undercover cop. This would solidify the police's evidence that Marin was the murderer. Guy Paul Marin's case was moving too slowly to satisfy the police and the public. In an effort to facilitate a conviction, Marin was placed in a jail cell that was occupied by Gordon Hobbs, a Toronto police officer posing as an inmate in an attempt to obtain details regarding Marin and his relationship with Christine Jessup. The officer claimed that Marin admitted to Red Rum the Innocent, referencing a 1980 horror film called The Shining. Two jailhouse informants, Robert May, who was identified as a chronic liar, and Mr. X, who was willing to fabricate evidence, also claimed that Marin had confessed to them. The prosecutors presented these men as reformed, suggesting they were testifying to ensure justice was served. During the second trial, Judge James Donnelly was far from impartial. His reputation as fair and reasonable preceded him and all the actions that followed in this case. Perhaps the most influential biased statement made by Judge Donnelly towards the jury was to consider the possibility that Jessup was abducted off the street rather than from within her home in order to fill in the blanks brought forth by the defense relating to issues of timing. Along with this, Donnelly consistently displayed his partiality by telling the jury to disregard evidence vital to the defense while crediting evidence brought forth by the prosecutor. Donnelly told the jury to disregard evidence such as the tape recording revealing Marin's lack of a confession and the credibility of Kenny Jessup's testimony. Also important to note is the judge's lack of proper address to the fact that a vast amount of evidence had been lost by the prosecution and forensic experts. 
These all played a role in Guy Paul Marin's wrongful conviction and later became the basis of his subsequent retrial. Time's run out But the hourglass Just flipped itself over so choose again Choose to fight for the truth the sun is slow Choose to fight for the innocent Take a stand side, against wrongful conviction waits to begin. If you dare to believe in life You might realize that there's no time for talking Or just wait around while the innocent 